Amen. Now let's put our hands together and welcome the Holy Ghost and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody, let's make some noise. Hallelujah. Can we give the Lord an ovation? Can we give the Lord the kind of praise that only He is worthy of? Yes, He is praiseworthy. Yes, He is holy. Yes, He is mighty and perfect in all of His ways. Glorious and matchless. There is none like our God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Glory to God. Give your neighbor a high five and tell somebody that Jesus Christ is Lord. Come on, proclaim it. Ooh, there's authority in the name. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Today I'm going to be sharing a word regarding Christ in the crisis. You know, sometimes in our walk with the Lord, there are mountaintops that are spectacular and I wish we could always remain there and, amen, observe the picturesque view, <laughs> the glory of God, amen. But you know, God transforms us from glory to glory, amen. In other words, there's a glorious moment, but then to get to the next mountaintop in your journey, often you have to uh, descend the hill and go through the valley. Sometimes in that valley, you'll discover places of darkness. Some call it the valley of the shadow of death. Who's ever walked in some dark places, even after you've known the Lord and walked with the Lord? And yet there were times of challenges and amen. And you might have thought if you were a young Christian, you didn't know that you had <laughs> signed up for that because maybe you thought, amen, that it would always seem to be uh, uh, mountaintops and uh, amen, the rose garden, the flowers breaking through, the sun shining. Uh, but there are times of challenge and difficulty. Why? Because a servant is not greater than his or her master. Amen. In other words, Jesus, yes, he is the conquering king, but also he was the suffering servant. He paid the price. Amen. He was betrayed, falsely accused. He was convicted for something he never did. And then ultimately he was crucified after suffering what really amounts to torture. He died for our sins and uh, we, too, at times go through challenges and difficulties. And how do we uh, understand, process, reconcile and walk in faith when it seems that uh, there are times that circumstances and situations or people seem to contradict uh, the faith of God in us and the faith of Christ revealed in us? Amen. So the Lord, he's always there and he's always the answer. Amen. And although you may not recognize what he's doing, comprehend or process, uh, that's okay. Because how many of you know that we, we are not God, amen? We're made in the image of God, uh, but there are some mysteries that, amen, we are learning uh, as the process unfolds, amen? And it's okay uh, to trust the Lord for things you don't understand. In fact, if you had to require of God that you understood everything before he did it, uh, then you would not need faith, <laughs> But it's impossible to please God except by faith. Amen. First, you've got to believe that he is. You can't even approach him until you know that the Lord is real. Amen. That his word is true. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. So today we're going to talk about how to discover Christ in your crisis. It's very important because it is the key to unlock the victory. Somebody say victory. So there's victory in the valley. And there is the light of Christ still shining in the dark place. And the question is, where, where are we looking? Where's our focus? Hallelujah. We have to see things as the Lord sees them. His perspective, God's viewpoint is truth. It's truth. Our opinions fall short. <laughs> the reality of the truth of God. There's a story of a young boy was talking to God, wanting to know what it's like in heaven, we know God's viewpoint. How do things look in heaven? He said, God, how are things different in heaven? How are, how's it different? She, he said, God, what is a million years like in heaven? He, he thought he heard God respond. A million years is like a second. He thought, oh. The boy asked God, what is a million dollars like? He thought he heard God say, a million dollars is like a penny. So the little boy asked God, God, can I have one of your pennies? 
to which he thought he heard the Lord say, just a second. <laughs> oh, help us, Lord, to see as you see. <laughs> God's promises are so awesome. You know, the Lord never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He's always there. He's there. Hell, he might feel distant from you, but it's not because he left. Amen. Sometimes it's so that the Lord would require that you would seek him. Amen. That you would pursue him, put him first above everything else. Stop looking to others or other sources for the answer when the Lord himself is the answer. Amen. He wants to be your protector today. He wants to be your provider today. He wants to be your provision today. Amen. Sometimes we're tested in our faith to see how we will respond to adverse circumstances, to the contradictions. Uh, but sometimes uh, things don't make sense. Hallelujah. Like the one time I was going on a road trip to Charlotte. Who's ever been to Charlotte? Amen. Bishop Ann was so generous to offer us to borrow her brand new SUV for the road trip. I think it had less than a thousand miles on it. Little did I know that I'd be the victim <laughs> of, I guess, uh, I don't know what to call it, negligent or reckless driving, but uh, the Lord works in mysterious ways, though. I've told this story before, but let me just share this, how the Lord protects us, because sometimes... <laughs> Uh, so basically, uh, someone collided into Bishop Ann's brand new car. Yes, I was behind the steering wheel. I honestly feel like it was unavoidable, Bishop. So, you know, you can't really assign blame. But so, because I, I was basically at a, at a red light turn green, I went forward, and, and, and a car perpendicular to me on my right also went forward and collided with the back right end. And, and so, but, but, but the worst thing was, you know, I immediately pulled over to make sure everyone was all right. I mean, you know, it was five miles an hour or maybe 10 of a collision. So, it was likely nobody was hurt, but you know, you would just want to jump out and check and see. And suddenly like out of nowhere, there was a police officer there. There was the lady driving the other car there. And then the lady immediately without hesitation told the police officer, and she was very young, probably about maybe 19. She said, he ran the red light like that. Now the thing was, that I, you know, I didn't run the red light. It had just turned green. I went forward. Um, it was so quick, so fluid in uh, the lack of veracity and truthfulness so quick just boom just flowed like turning on a faucet and uh, but the police officer said no no he didn't run the red light because if he ran the red light I ran the red light because what she didn't see was the police car was over to my left kind of obscuring her view he was right beside me we were both at the same red light and so the Lord amen he has his ways <laughs> but sometimes when things don't seem like they're, they're going right the Lord still is working in it and you might not fully recognize it. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there's things that, uh, they appear to be one thing, uh, but they're really something else. There's a, st there's a story of a, of, of a lady who was, uh, she was, um, uh, arrested for yelling and screaming and carrying on a fit out on the street at the car in front of her. Uh, she was taken to a police station where she was searched, fingerprinted and photographed and placed in a holding cell. And according to the story, after a couple of hours, a policeman escorted her back to the booking desk where the officer waiting for her uh, said, I'm very sorry for the mistake. You see, when I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, screaming and threatening the car in front of you, I noticed the what would Jesus do bumper sticker, the choose life license plate holder and the follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker and the chrome plated fish emblem on the trunk. Naturally, I assumed the car was stolen. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're out on the roads, remember, <laughs> the Lord is watching. The enemy's watching too. People are watching. Bishop Ann always tells that great story. Remember you're on candid camera when she was in the plane and uh, amen. Don't, don't ever let the enemy see you sweat, right? Uh, but sometimes things aren't what they appear. And, and, and we can think that, we can think our afflictions are, are allowed, caused, by God, uh, based on our, our, our performance or, or maybe our faith level or, or maybe it's, you know, our holiness level. Uh, you know, let, let, me, let me show you what the scripture says. Isaiah chapter 53, verse four through five, says this about Jesus. This is a messianic prophecy about the Lord coming to redeem man from all of his sins. And that says, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. 
In other words, there's an assumption when we see trouble and difficulty, and even in this case, when the Messiah came and people saw him convicted and him tortured and him crucified, they assumed, well, surely he must have done some great evil, just when the, as if when the Apostle Paul, you remember the story, and the, the, the viper jumps out of the wood and, and he's bitten, and immediately when he's bitten, the people observing said, well, he must have been an evil man and a murderer because this is a poisonous snake, and they expected him to die immediately. We come to conclusions, and we make judgments, and we evaluate situations on the surface, but this wasn't the case. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 tells us Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, we are healed. Just the opposite was true. When those were judging him being smitten by God, he was being smitten for them, for us. In Luke chapter 13, let's turn there real quick. Luke chapter 13, there's a story where Jesus is asked about some disasters that occurred and they were just pondering, discussing it actually. In verse four, Jesus says about this tower collapsing in Salome, he says, or on those 18 upon whom the tower fell in Salome and slew them, in other words, they died, do you think that they were sinners worse above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, verse five, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So, yes, it's true that sin ultimately brings forth death. The scripture teaches that and destruction. Uh, however, we see from this passage, it seems an accident, a calamity occurred in some kind of almost a random way. Jesus didn't give an explanation that uh, this tower fell on them because they were worse sinners or there were some murderer amongst them and God was dealing with them. Uh, he instead kind of shifts the attention and focus not on the victims of this crisis, but he says, uh, except you repent, you shall all also likewise perish. In other words, it was important for Jesus to preach this message that we all and all people understood that there is a judgment day coming. And without Jesus, we cannot have eternal life. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God that there's a way of salvation. Thank God that we don't have to try to fulfill the Old Testament law of Judaism because it's impossible to fulfill. Jesus is the only one who's ever 100% fulfilled the law in order to attain righteousness. Thank God that when there was no way, that God made a way. Recently, I was at a uh, seminar of some top theologians in the world, some really brilliant minds, intellectuals, and uh, praise the Lord for the ones that are born again. There's several of them that are. Uh, Not all of them, believe it or not, in the world of academic theology. Uh, But I had an interesting conversation from an Ivy League school professor uh, just kind of on one of the breaks. I had a lot of great conversations, very positive ones. But I just want to share this one, and maybe, I don't know, positive or negative, you you be the judge, but uh, we were just discussing a scripture that she brought up about uh, her her theology, and then it became clear uh, that she was interpreting the scripture in a way to believe uh, that everyone is going to go to heaven. Um, although the scripture is very clear, it was saying that, you know, in, in Christ you have life, and but in Adam all die, but uh, she was kind of putting this weird spin on it, and so I thought maybe I'm just really hearing her wrong. So I went later and kind of just exegeted the text with simple, practical, basic hermeneutics. In other words, just in case you don't know, there's kind of a basic way of translating the Bible that's pretty fundamental and existed for centuries. And, and it works pretty good. <laughs> you know, the church fathers taught on it in the first few centuries. So when I looked at the text and I was just breaking it down, I could, it was just so simple and so straightforward. It was obvious what it said that, amen, that only those that are categorically in Christ are the ones who would have life. In other words, eternal life. And those who were in Adam all have uh, death because of the the curse of sin that came as a result of Adam. Uh, Amen. And so I just wanted, when I thought, wow, if, you know, someone who is a scholarly theologian type can be that confused about what the Bible teaches. Amen. I just wanted to make it clear today 
so that everyone knows, amen, there's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. And if everyone was going to be saved, we wouldn't need Jesus, and God the Father wouldn't send Jesus. He wouldn't have had to die on the cross. So, amen, the whole point of Christ dying on the cross for your sins and my sins is so that we have the opportunity to be set free, that our sins can be removed from us, that we have atonement or redemption. In other words, our sins are paid for because of the sacrifice of Jesus. But if you believe, amen, it is for the believer. And it's so important today that we understand, amen, that there's only one way. Jesus declared it. I'm the truth, the life, and the way. No man or person comes to the Father except by me. Amen. He said he was, he's the gate. He's the door. He's the good shepherd. Hallelujah. He's the only begotten son of the father. There is no other way to heaven, but through Jesus. Amen. So be very clear. I know there's many other really people say, what about other religions? Other religions, don't they all lead to God? They might lead to a God with a lowercase g. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Which is like a, a, a demonic spirit. But they don't lead to the God of the Bible. Amen. They don't lead to the way of eternal life, which is only through Jesus. Kind of a side note. Uh, amen. But I want to encourage you today to know that Jesus is the way. And Jesus makes this point. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Mankind is under a sentence of death because of sin. And unless we repent... We shall all likewise perish. Thank God. Repentance is a gift. Repentance is an opportunity. Repentance is a blessing. Amen. It is the chance God gives mankind to change your mind and to say yes to the Lord's way and to say no to our own futile way of thinking that we are so overconfident in. Thank you, Jesus, for making a way when there was no way. Hallelujah. Amen. But We need to recognize there are other reasons for difficult times, crisis, and calamity that the scripture addresses. Look in John chapter 9. Turn to John chapter 9 real quick, verse 1. John chapter 9, verse 1. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? They always want to know who sinned to cause it. Because they knew that sin could open the door for sickness. They knew that sin ultimately would produce death and that there were consequences for sin. So they're always looking for when they saw something negative, then there must be a sin connected. So they said, teacher, who sinned? This man's blind. Was it, was it him or was it his parents? But he, you know, he was born blind. So could, could, could it have been, you know, they, and so Jesus answered in verse three, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Doesn't mean they didn't have any sin. Every person has sin. But what he meant was obviously there's no sin that they committed that caused the condition But he said that the works of God should be revealed in him. In other words, Jesus Christ wants to reveal his glory even in your crisis or your perceived crisis or your real crisis or whatever situation you're facing. He is there to glorify himself. Amen. Jesus answered. uh, Also, verse four says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which it says translated means sent. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. Amen. Jesus is a healer, and Jesus is the great physician, and Jesus not only healed the blind 2,000 years ago, but Jesus still heals the blind today. Amen. In 2019, he raises the dead. Yes, he can cleanse the leper and he casts out demons. Amen. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. The same Jesus who did it then is doing it now, but he's doing it through his church. Amen. He's doing it through the body of Christ. That means we become the extension of the Lord in the earth as the followers of God, of Jesus. We bring his kingdom wherever we go to cast out demons and to heal the sick. Thank God. Hallelujah. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Woo. Hallelujah. Translated sent. And so obedience is so important. Hallelujah. Sometimes the Lord is trying to send us, but we're too busy trying to go on an assignment of our own choosing. And obedience is where the blessing is. Obedience is where the anointing will flow. Obedience is where the presence of God will manifest for you is in the place of doing his will. Hallelujah. So if some negative crisis occur and it wasn't because somebody sinned, 
and it was so that God could be glorified, how should we, therefore, as Christians, respond to difficult times, to situations that are adverse, to challenging circumstances? Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Let me answer this for us today. Let the word of God answer us today. How should you respond? Hallelujah. Verse 17, Romans chapter 8. And of children, then heirs. Everybody say heirs of God. Amen. (laughs) There's a will. Amen. A new will and testament. (laughs) You are joint heirs with Christ. Look at this. If indeed you suffer with him. Look at that verse 17. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Hallelujah. Verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory (laughs) which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation is groaning, eagerly waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. This world still hasn't seen who you are yet. Amen. And I believe that the world still hasn't witnessed what a church looks like yielded fully to the power of the Holy Spirit, to the persuasion of the Word of God, to the anointing that only comes from heaven. I believe that we are, though, on the cusp of great outpouring. Amen. We are on the precipice of a move of God like we have never seen or witnessed before. Amen. I believe the Lord is getting ready to pour out his spirit. And if we'll come into divine alignment, we will see the Lord reveal his glory uh, in a historic, unprecedented fashion on planet earth. Thank you, Jesus. Number one way you got to respond to an adverse situation is in faith. Somebody say faith. So the word of God says, okay, so the suffering is nothing compared to the glory. (laughs) Hallelujah. And the glory's coming. Hallelujah. So we look ahead. We're looking forward to what God has. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me give you another one. Here we go. I know we're getting a little into some teaching. Teaching's good. Teaching's good. We're going to build precept upon precept. Amen. And build some solid doctrine in the word of God. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. How should you as a Christian respond? Number one, in faith. Now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is light, not heavy, is short, not long, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It's kind of a play on words here because they understood that the, the, the Jews did, at least, that the kabod meant weight, the weight of his presence. You could feel it resting on you, manifesting on your life. And he said, oh, okay, you got a light affliction, but consider the weight of the glory that God is getting ready to rest on you. And what you're going through is temporary. I'll praise God for that word. It said it's just before a moment. Hallelujah. Amen. So we respond, amen, in faith, but we also respond on the word, based on the word, amen, which is faith in action, amen. Our light affliction is but for a moment, but is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Thank you, Jesus. Look at verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Selah. Come on, look at it again. Verse 18. You do not look at the things which are seen, See, right now we're looking around. We're seeing the things which we can see with our eyes. What a gift from the Lord. Praise God for vision. Amen. We can see. Uh, Amen. But the things, there are things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. There it is again. Amen. It's just for a moment. But the things which are not seen, they are eternal. Hallelujah. How can you say your affliction is light? How can you say it's light? Sometimes the affliction sure seems heavy, difficult, unbearable, unbelievable. The answer is in verse 18. We just read it. We do not look at the things which are seen. What are you looking at? What are you observing? 
things that can be seen. See, faith sees the invisible and flesh sees the situation. Flesh sees the circumstances. Faith sees God's perspective. Faith sees the word of the Lord. Faith sees that with God, all things are possible. Faith sees that by his stripes, you are healed. Faith sees that he shall meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. Faith sees that the impossible becomes possible with our God. Hallelujah. Faith moves mountains. Faith changes circumstances, but you're not going to begin to operate in faith until first you see what God sees. We have to open our spiritual eyes to behold that the promise is yes and amen, and that God's word never fails. Amen. He's a covenant-keeping God. Hallelujah. Oh, he doesn't lie. Let God be true, and every man a liar. His word will never fail. But we're looking at the wrong thing. We're looking at the natural circumstances. Let me give you real super quick three things that you shouldn't look at in a crisis. <laughs> Number one, don't look at the problem. Don't look at the problem. Some of you, uh, you, see, you know, you, you see the, the hole, but not the donut. You got to see the donut. <laughs> oh, but there's a part missing. <laughs> but now you can get the, you know, the donut holes at the. <laughs> it, it, it depends on what you're looking at, how you see it. Um, I haven't told this story in a long time, but <laughs> there's, there's a story about uh, Jared and Ralph who uh, were answering, and there was an ad that's uh, for a local university that they were, they were doing these experiments on, on wolves, and, and um, they would give them $3,000 for a live wild wolf that was caught. So they, you know, got their hunting gear. They thought, you know, we're going to go out and get a wolf. And they searched all day out in the, the, the wilderness there in the woods. They couldn't find anything. Late at night, they started a fire and they went to sleep. And uh, in the middle of the night, Jared heard this noise, a little rustling in the leaves. He woke up and he saw these eyes looking at him, just glowing. He looked around, saw more eyes. Must have been surrounded by a dozen wolves. Heard the growling, the growling of these wolves. And he's, he's, hey, Ralph, wake up. Look, look, we're rich. We're rich. <laughs> he got all excited uh, because he saw it in a different way. Amen. Sometimes we're focused on the wrong thing. We have to see situations as God sees them. You're not going to see things as God sees them unless you are recognizing that you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In other words, your vantage point has to change from the position of faith. You're looking downward on the problem from a place of exalted authority in Christ, recognizing not only the supremacy of Jesus, but the reality that according to the word that you're seated with Christ in those heavenly places. Hallelujah. And so, yes, you might be here down here on planet earth, but in truth, you're in Christ. You're with Christ. You're above the problem. The devil's under your feet. God has already conquered. Hallelujah. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you, you shall condemn. Why? Because you're in a place of authority. Amen. So number one, don't look at the problem. Number two, don't look at the past. This is a trick of the devil. Satan will try to cause you to focus on things, mistakes perhaps that you've made or situations you've gone through. But God is the God of the right now. So don't look back. Don't look like Lot's wife back at, amen, her old home. And you know the story. It's a lie. It wasn't that good. The children of Israel had the opportunity to be free, and they're sitting there complaining to Moses that they missed the garlic and the leeks. They must have forgot about <laughs> the fact they were putting more straw with that mud to build those bricks. They were enslaved, but they looked back and they thought it was better. It was a deception of the enemy. And sometimes like a dog returns to his vomit, we're sitting there thinking about, you know, old friends or old hangouts, old environments, old patterns, old ways. Uh, it's time to look ahead. Amen. When you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not worthy of the kingdom. Amen. Don't look at the past. Lift up your eyes and look to the Lord. Amen. God wants us to move forward. Hallelujah. It's just like when a runner runs a race, they're on that starting line. They don't turn and face the other way. <laughs> Some of us are turning. We're looking, we're facing the wrong direction. Turn around. Amen. Don't look at the past. Don't look at the problem. Uh, and, and finally, don't look at a person 
or the wrong person. Amen. You can look to Jesus. Let's, let's turn here. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Let me give you a little more. I'm going to give you some teaching on the word today. I hope this blesses you. Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, oh, let me remove your speck from your eye there. <laughs> and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye. And then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, sometimes we play, we, we, we play the blame game. And when something goes wrong, I guess maybe it's American culture, you know, we look into a sign blame. <laughs> Who's at fault? What person caused this wrong to occur in my life? And, and we look to a person to blame. And the problem is when you focus on blaming another person for what your challenge is, what your crisis is, you remove yourself from the equation. You remove yourself and your faith and your prayers from being the agent of change necessary for your situation to turn around. So don't abdicate your authority by blaming someone when you already have the answer. There's a story about this girl. She was riding along on her bike when she bumps her head on a low hanging branch of a tree. She runs into her house hollering, mom, Joey hit me. Her mom looked up from what she was doing and said, sissy, Joey didn't hurt you. Joey's not even here. He went to the grocery store with your dad. The little girl got the startled look on her face and said, you mean stuff like this can happen on its own at any time? Whoa, what a bummer. <laughs> Sometimes people always look to blame someone. That's what Satan does, isn't it? Do you know Satan means accuser? Can you imagine Satan day and night? <laughs> accuser of the brethren before God's throne, accusing day and night. I mean, that's more than a full-time job. That's more than eight hours a day. He doesn't quit. He's an accuser. It's his nature, but it's not our nature. We're not to be like the devil. In fact, we're to be the opposite. And in fact, if someone is overtaken in a fault in the church, the Bible says that we would restore such a one, not criticize them, not gossip about them. Did you hear this? Did you hear that? No, we're to restore them, pray for them. Amen. Ah, hallelujah. So the key is <laughs> we have to look to the right person. Amen. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the answer. Hallelujah. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews chapter 12, verse two says, looking unto Jesus. Someone turn to your neighbor and say, look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. Mm. <laughs> Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. So if difficulty comes, if crisis comes, if circumstances come that are challenging to explain, that seems to contradict your faith, amen, don't look to blame a person. Don't look at the problem, amen, and don't look at the circumstance, but look to Jesus. He's the answer. He's the answer. We got to shake it off. Shake off everything the devil tries to dump on you, every situation, every lie. It's important, I believe, in this season that we're equipped to preach the gospel even in the face of persecution of those who don't know the Lord. It's one thing for someone to not know the Lord. It's another thing for someone who doesn't know the Lord to be an agent of the devil to harass you or to afflict you. And we're called, hallelujah, to, in a spirit of love, amen, to pray for them. That's why Jesus said to pray for your enemies. Did you know that? I mean, that's a hard one, isn't it? A lot of the other ones we can, you know, at least I can do that. But when Jesus said pray for your enemies, what? Did I read that correct? got to shake off those negative circumstances. Shake off adversity. Keep your eyes on Jesus. I love this story. One day, a farmer, a farmer's donkey fell down into a well. 
The farmer decided the animal was old and the well needed to be covered up anyway, so he just started shoveling some dirt in the well. Him and some of his co-workers and family all started shoveling dirt together and they could hear that old donkey down there kind of yelling out. And a few shovel loads later, the farmer finally looked down the well and he was amazed at what he saw. That every <laughs> shovel load of dirt that hit the back of that donkey, he was doing something amazing. He would shake it off and he'd step up. <laughs> shake it off and he'd step up. And before long, that donkey stepped up over the edge and he trotted away and he got out of that hole. See, some of you today, you just need to shake it off and step up and watch that the Lord is your answer. Hallelujah. That Christ is in the midst of your crisis. He hasn't left you all alone. Amen. James chapter one, verse two says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Whoo, hallelujah. God is perfecting you. God is completing you. God didn't abandon you. The Lord is there with you. God has the answer. We have to look to him today. I want to ask you to please stand up as we prepare to close. Amen. And we're going to look to the Lord together in prayer as the author and the finisher of our faith and recognize, amen, that Christ is in every single one of our challenges, every one of our tests, every one of our trials, any, every single one of our circumstances that we can't seem to process or understand. That's okay. The Lord understands. Amen. And he may choose to download to our comprehension, what we desire to know, but whether he does or whether he doesn't, that's what faith is. Amen. I may not understand, but I trust you. It may not go the way that I thought or the way I wanted or expected, but Lord, I trust you. I believe you are faithful. Amen. And that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called, be called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. So don't be so quick to look for, well, it was this sin or that sin. Don't be so quick to look to blame this person or that person, or don't be so quick to look into your past to find an explanation when the Lord may be perfecting you, completing his work in you all along. <laughs> He's faithful. He's faithful. His word is true. It never fails. I want to ask you to lift your hands to the Lord. We want to pray together. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. That in times of difficulty, you are right here with us. You promise in your word to never leave us and to never forsake us. God, we are believers. We believe that you cannot lie. That your promise is true. Today, God, as we've heard the teaching of the word of God, we pray that you would equip us to grow in faith and unto maturity that Lord we would know how to respond even in confusing times and challenging times and adverse times and difficult times Lord we know that you are in control hallelujah for we call upon you we invite you to perform your perfect will for your kingdom to come and your will to be done in earth as it is in heaven Lord, today I pray for everyone in this house where Satan has lied. I pray that you uproot the deception. Where Satan has come to intimidate, I pray you remove the fear. God, where thoughts, carnal thoughts, have come with questions and questioning of you. Father, I pray that every thought would be brought captive into the obedience of Christ. And Lord, even every thought that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God, let it be brought low and put under our feet. For today we choose the mind of Christ that, Lord, you would help us to know what you know, what we need to know. Give us the perspective of heaven, not of the flesh, not of carnal thinking, not of our own logical conclusions. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus, to transcend, to ascend, to think as you think. God, I pray for breakthrough today. I pray, God, that you transform us today. Thank you that you're the healer. 
Thank you that you bring peace in the midst of every storm. Father, we pray for those who are healing from the tragedy that occurred in the city just a few weeks ago. We pray for this city of Virginia Beach. We decree that the devil cannot and will not have his way. God, we stand in the authority of the word of God. By the power of the blood of Jesus, we command every spirit of confusion, spirit of murder, spirit of deception to be cast out of the city of Virginia Beach. We claim this city for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we tell you, devil, that you cannot have it. Satan, you will not operate in this city. And Father, by the authority of the name of Jesus and by the power of the blood of the Lamb, we serve an eviction notice to hell today. And we declare Satan has got to go in the name of Jesus Christ. And God, we release the angels of heaven to move throughout this entire land and Hampton Roads and Virginia Beach and Rock Church. Hallelujah. And escort out every adversary. <laughs> Bless your people today. Father, anoint them. Let the joy of the Lord be their strength. And God, teach us how to walk in the victory. Mountaintop or valley, you're there. And we give you the glory and praise in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said amen. Can we put our hands together?